This bike is absolutely cutting edge. Released just this year, it's got disc brakes, electronic gears, it's super light, it's super aero, and yet it's also still comfortable thanks to the compliance from its carbon fiber frame. I mean, it is absolutely a super bike. But how good is it really? I mean, I only ask the question because this has been designed to be raced and therefore it has to comply by a really strict set of rules that's been laid down by cycling's international governing body. Now, I haven't done a road race in six years. I suspect many of you have never even been tempted and yet I can almost guarantee that your bike will have been designed to at least allow you to take to the start line. So what would happen if you ignored those rules, threw off the shackles, you know, got a little creative. Ha ha! Boom! This rather funky little number is a Tri-Rig Omni. As the name suggests, it is a triathlon bike, or more specifically, a non-drafting triathlon bike. And as such, it's been designed to be used with aero handlebars up front. But it does, as you can see, have the versatility to allow it to fit drop handlebars if you wished. Now, I suspect that no one has ever wished to before, but uh, here you go. Now, first things first, other than the love it or leave it aesthetics, this bike has been designed purely around aerodynamics. Because seemingly the one rule that iron men and women are governed by with their bikes is to balance straight line speed against crosswind stability. So in this case, what they've done, firstly, is to make the bike insanely narrow. The theory being that you'll then keep that frontal area as low as possible. The second thing is to remove as many edges as possible between the front and the back of the bike. So in this case, therefore, you can see I have no down tube and I also have no seat stays either. That does mean that I've lost where I would normally put my water bottle. So instead, I'd have to tuck it behind my seat. But what I get instead from that giant carbon fiber beam is an integrated top tube bag. Yes, I am men and women love a storage solution even more than IKEA do. And so right here, built into the carbon fiber, is a little storage compartment. So what kind of things can you put in there then? Well, I have quickly learned anything long and thin. So in this case, I've got a Ginster's sausage roll and also several wriggly worms, which have the added benefit of being able to be eaten almost entirely hands-free. i tell you what though, I have got a really dry mouth. So, what do our good friends at the UCI have to say about this then? Here we go, right. Preamble, their words, not mine. Bicycles shall comply with the spirit and principle of cycling as a sport. The spirit presupposes that cyclists will compete in competitions on an equal footing. The principle asserts the primacy of man over machine. Principles definition 1.3.007. The bicycle is a vehicle with two wheels. 1.3.010. The bicycle shall be propelled solely through a chain set by the legs. Inferior muscular chain. Moving in a circle. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Hello? Huh? Fairings. What? Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Basically, the tubes of a road bike need to fit within this outline. As you can see on the Trek Madone, some of them are a squeeze, but unsurprisingly, they all fit perfectly. When we swap to our Tri-Rig Omni, uh, well, not so much. And we haven't even mentioned the fairings that make the brakes more aero. They contravene rule 1.3.024. Well, I'll spare you the details of that one. Now, I suspect there are two burning questions remaining. Firstly, does ripping up the rule book actually make a bike better? Well, should we see? Now, it's perhaps not fair to compare them too closely, given that I'm not remotely using this bike for its intended purpose, which is, of course, time trials within triathlons. 
and so it's perhaps for that reason that the bike's not particularly light comes in about nine kilos which is kind of ironic i suppose given that the uci also have their minimum weight rule and this doesn't remotely trouble it and of course because this is designed primarily for steady state effort it doesn't have to be particularly stiff and that's part of the reason why they've managed to get it quite as narrow as they have given that most top-end modern carbon road bikes are typically built with quite wide tubes with more material placed at the edges but it's better placed to brace against torsional stress but then it doesn't really matter in time trials indeed there's a growing band of advocates for flexier frames for just this kind of purpose but it's when you take it out on the open road where you might want to lay down a bit of power to go over a steep climb or throw in a little sprint that you might actually want something a little bit on the stiffer side but you've got to say on fast roads this thing is insanely quick and it feels pretty damn special Oh, what baby oil slippery stuff. So in this case then, it's clear that our hyperbike is designed specifically to excel in one area, possibly two. And like most things that are designed to excel in one area, possibly two, you're going to have to make compromises in others. A bit like a Formula One car, I guess, which is amazing at driving around a track, but you could imagine would probably come unstuck if you were driving around a multi-storey car park. But what's become clear from riding this bike and that Trek Madone is that although professional road racing is the pinnacle of cycle sport, just like Formula One, you can't actually draw a parallel between the two because an aero road bike is way, way more versatile than a Formula One car. It's more versatile than a Bugatti Veyron, in fact. I mean, it's stiff, it's light, it's fast, and it's comfortable as well. The only thing missing, really, is massive tyre clearance so you could take it off-road. But I think the fact is the market for aero gravel bikes is relatively niche and the one we know of, the 3T Exploro, actually doesn't break any UCI rules. So the question then is that actually could you build an all-rounder better by throwing off the shackles of those UCI rules? I mean, certainly you can make a superbike lighter in order to make it into a hyperbike. You can go way lighter than 6.8 kilos, which is the current limit, if you have the cash. But the fact is that super lightweight bike will not be aerodynamic because in order to make aerodynamic tube shapes, you have to add more material. So does that mean then that the UCI rules are not stopping superbikes from becoming hyperbikes? Well, we put that question to a couple of our mates. Firstly, Director of Engineering at Cervelo, Graham Strive, and then also the Head of Education at the Bicycle Academy, Tom Sturdy. And both of them independently said that actually the 100-year-old double triangle frame design ends up being pretty darn good. Now, there are still some UCI rules that restrict the aerodynamics. So for example, that three to one ratio, which controls the width of the tube shape compared to the depth of the tube shape, still exists on components like your handlebars and your seat posts. So I guess the answer to that question is both yes and also no at least with the materials that we have at the moment. Who knows, with graphene infused resin in our carbon fiber or with the rise of metallic foam, maybe we will be able to have the holy trinity of super aero, super light, and also super comfortable. Until that point though, I guess we're just gonna have to make do with having hyperbikes that are dedicated to excelling in one specific area. A little bit like hypercars then. The problem being that you're going to need more than one.